Welcome back to Sometimes Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Grill, and I'm sitting in the Kenny Motorsports studio. And today I have a special guest on Zoom. It is Trayvon Free. Trayvon Free is an Oscar winning director, an Emmy winning writer, a former NCAA basketball player, a shoe aficionado, and it turns to find out, come to find out, a huge Formula One fan uh, and a friend of Booney's. So uh, you can thank Booney for setting this up. Um, thank you for taking the time, Trayvon. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. I'm good, man. Just, you know, burning through the week. Glad it's Friday. Got a couple uh got a couple practices under our belt. So it's it's been it's been a good week. That's good. Yeah, and of course I want to ask all these things about what you've been up to this week and you're like gonna tell me I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll you know some a lot of it you'll you'll probably see on, on deadline in, in a, probably a couple weeks. But okay. it's been a it's been a very productive week. If if all things if all things pan out that have that have been put into motion this week, awesome. I'm going to be a very busy person next year. Um, that's that's a good I mean, good problem to actually have. Actually, this year too, because one of them start one of them kind of started already. So awesome. Yeah, like I, I started following you on Instagram and just kind of see all the different things you've been up to. So it's yes, yeah, it's, it's just interesting to to see everything that you're you're working on without actually telling us what you're working on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of movies and there's some doc stuff and some TV stuff. That's all kind of in various stages. Some of it, you know, closer to um, being able to talk about than, than others, but I'm excited for people to see the crazy things I've been kind of doing in the background of all this other shit I've been doing. <laughs> yep, yep. No, that, that, that's super cool. Um, but we can kind of jump into it real fast. Um, just curious, how do you even get to the point where you become an Oscar winning director? Cause it's my understanding. This is, this is your first, uh, directorial, uh, trip down that, down that path. It's, uh, yeah, it's my first, uh, piece of film directing. I've done commercials. I've done some TV. Um, but yeah, that was the first movie I'd ever directed. I wrote it, directed it with my directing partner, Martin Desmond Rowe. Um, and um, I mean, we've since become directing partners by virtue of this project. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, it was one of those things that it's hard to even qualify simply because as a writer, director, person who like creates things in Hollywood, you, you dream of like winning the major awards, the Emmys, the Oscars. Um, and I had no idea how I would ever win an Oscar, you know, like I, I did not know if that was ever going to be in the cards for me. It's a very difficult thing to achieve for anyone. Mm -hmm. There's so much that goes into having in, into a winning year that you just can't even predict or plan for. And so, you know, as a writer and someone who's getting into directing, you just, you hope that even you, even getting nominated to be acknowledged amongst your peers, or even if you never get nominated, just becoming an Academy member is a big deal. Um, and so it happened in a way where I think a lot of the best things have happened, where you don't plan it, you don't think about it. You just find yourself in a position where it's possible all of a sudden. And so from last year, like coming up with an idea and then writing it very quickly and then doing the impossible and the ridiculous of trying to make a movie during COVID last year when there was no vaccine, there was no anything. It was such a, just a huge swing and a huge gamble. Um, and it turns out like the movie was good and people liked it. And the more and more we, we showed it to people, the more uh, we realized oh, we might actually have something here. <laughs> like, it, it's definitely the kind of thing that in the wrong hands could have been done way poorly. And um, once we got to December of last year and we realized, oh, we actually, like, 
have a shot, it was like game on. And so what's crazy too is, you know, when you campaign a movie in any category for the Oscars, there's like usually a year lead up to that campaign, right? So mm-hmm. um, you shoot the movie just use some make up some numbers you shoot the movie in 2019 for it to come out in 2020 for it to be in the oscars in the beginning of 2021 right and the same with shorts you shoot it the year before very very early into the the calendar year of the award season and you run it through festivals and all kind of shit and then if you're good enough you make it you you make it onto the short list for the oscars and so on and so on we shot our movie with two with three months left to su- with submissions for the Oscars. We didn't <laughs> run through a single festival. We just there was literally we shot at the end of September and the movie was submitted for the Oscars as the first December first or second. Good grief. And then for those that aren't aware, we're talking about the movie Two Distant Strangers, which can be found on Netflix for those that uh that haven't seen it already, I highly recommend it. It's uh, um, it's about a black guy that's just trying to get home to his dog, and he keeps having and he's keep and he keeps having an altercation with a cop, and then he dies or gets killed by the cop, and then wakes up in this in the in the same bed, reliving the day like Groundhog Day over and over and over. So, how like so you have the idea and you write it, and it was my understanding you wrote it in like five days. Yeah, <laughs> which is crazy, but <laughs> that, that, that's because that's coming from me who can't write. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you you take this idea. How did like I'm I'm totally green to like the industry in general. So I have, I have these ignorant sure. questions. <laughs> um, how do you take that and just go? Okay, now I need like where do I get this money? Like where, how do I get people to give me the money to actually film this? Right. So with like with something like a short they're typically independent, almost into, almost always independent. Rarely do studios themselves finance them right out of the gate or make them, but they do. But most times it's like, you have an idea, you get people, you, you source money, you get people to give you money, you shoot it and you sell it to one of the network, one of the studios. And then they like push it for awards. And so in this particular case, it's, it was the same way. It was like, I wrote the script and then I started sending it to everyone I knew who could possibly either give me money or point me in the direction of someone who could give me money to make it. And, you know, part of the concept of it um, and the economy of it was also what landed itself to being even possible was because like it repeats itself. So I don't have to go very many places (laughs) when I'm shooting this. It's like very, very contained in that way. Um, But you just start sending, you start sending it around and, People will say yes or no. And there's obviously like a business component where you have to set up a bank account and do all this stuff that like legally connected to the entity of the film um, that some that you have a producer who you pay to deal with all that shit. Um, But (laughs) for the most part, you are just going around in the same way, uh, you know, drivers do when they are trying to get sponsors. Right. Like they. You go around and you're trying to get people to give you money so you can drive next season. It's just, it's very similar. It's like going to rich people and going, hey, can you give me anything to make this? I need my budget's like 250. What can you give me anything? And by the time you've gone through five, seven, ten people, you've made up your budget or made up a good portion of it. And we were lucky enough to get money from, you know, very wealthy people who gave us large chunks of money, 50,000, 80,000, 50,000, 25,000. And a lot of people gave us 10,000. Um, and then that adds up over time to, you know, the about half a million dollars it costs to shoot it. That, well, that's awesome. I think that's a, a really good analogy that I never really thought about. Cause yeah, like any driver that's tra- chasing after sponsors is going to get like a driver deck and they list off like all their accolades and what, and their goals Yep. And, and then like their social media reach and all that stuff. And then I would yep. imagine it's very similar. <laughs> yeah. If you're working the indie, if you're doing anything independent shorts or, in, or independent features, it's that it's going to people going, here's why you should give me your money. Okay. Very interesting. And then have you always 
been into like writing and videography and, and directing stuff like that? Or is that something that kind of came later in life? Writing, writing came first. I had been writing since I was a kid and it wasn't until college when I tore my meniscus in basketball and I had to sit out for a year that I was able to really focus on it um, at like a collegiate level, at like a higher level. But I had been writing stories and poems and all kind of shit like my whole life. It wasn't until I got to college, even through even through grade school, my teachers would always say, I always got the highest score on papers. My paper was always used as the example for the class projects. <laughs> and I was always that kid with like, this is the teacher holding up my paper as the example for, you know, how to do the thing. And I never paid attention to what that meant. I just thought like, if I get good grades, I get to play basketball and that's all that matters. And, um, but it wasn't until my English teacher in high school pulled me aside and was like, you know, you're really good at this. You should kind of, you should pay attention to this talent that you have that I realized, I thought of it as a thing. I was like, Oh, like, okay. Writing. I I've, I've been spending my whole, you know, childhood and teen years pursuing basketball and athletics, but I, at least I know I have this other thing that I'm good at. And once I got hurt, I spent that year redshirting, just kind of doing writing stuff, writing classes and taking screenwriting courses um, at my university at Long Beach State. And um, it ended up being, um, ended up working out where my professor who became my mentor it was just like, this is what you should be doing. Like you're six. He was like, literally like fuck basketball. This is like, you should be doing this. <laughs> Did that kind of play into uh, your choice to go to Long Beach state? I know you had a, like I listened to one of the other podcasts you've been on. And, and if you want to listen to about your basketball career, um, hit up YouTube and check out a good conversation um, with, oh, what's his name? Mark. Uh, that's a really, yeah, it's a really good, po- really good podcast. If you want to hear more about his um Trayvon's basketball career. Um, But did that play a huge role in kind of the kind of like that backup plan of not just basketball when you picked Long Beach State? Yeah, they, they have a very good film program. You know, Steven Spielberg went there. um, I knew it was something about the school that I liked. I wanted to be a film major, but I couldn't because of my, my scholarship for basketball Um, because the, the major takes up so much time. Um, away from the class, you know, doing projects, making movies and that kind of thing. Um, so once I had that red shirt year, I was like, oh, well, I don't have to go to practice. I don't have to play. I can do the thing that I kind of wanted to do um, anyway. And then I discovered, well, I'm not going to play professionally. So here's another thing, another avenue for me to pursue um, career wise. And it was like, I went from one crazy pipe dream to another <laughs> it was like I'm, I'm just pursuing careers where you have a one percent chance of succeeding <laughs> this, is, this is like the story of my life right yep, yep. Um, and um you know once I realized it was something I enjoyed and something that I could like make a career out of I just kind of stuck with it I started doing stand-up my senior year of college and kept doing that out of college and that introduced me to a lot of great people a lot of funny people and, oh, and created job opportunities. I was actually listening to some of your stand-up. Um, I think it was like from 2011, laughing out loud at work. And <laughs> so, I mean, it, again, check out uh, Trayvon Free's YouTube channel if you want to see some of his older uh, stand-up stuff. It's really funny. <laughs> I, was, I was having a good listen to it. But, uh, so did that lead to like your big your big break, like your stand-up comedy? You're right. Like, yeah. the, I guess what, what led to what I would, I'm considering your big break, which would be the job at The Daily Show? Yeah, so that was that goes back to you know a night of stand up where I did a show. A buddy of mine was hosting a show at the Improv and had someone drop out of the lineup, and he'd asked me to fill in, and I said yeah. And on that show, I met a guy named Rob Cutner, who I had been following on Twitter and such, and he wrote for the Daily Show for many years, and had left and was at the time writing for Conan. And um, we were sitting at the bar after the show, just kind of chatting, having a good time. And um, and we started talking about his daily show days. And then a couple of days later, Kristen Shaw's husband, who was a writer on the show, left the show and they did like an on-air send off for him. And so I knew someone was leaving, which means there was an opening. <laughs> 
And so I, I hit up Rob and I didn't even ask him, you know, to help me get the job. I just said, you know, hey, can you just tell me what it's like to submit? Like, what do you have to do? Like, what's the pack submission packet like? Um, which is like the requirements for the show whenever you submit for a TV show or write for a show. Which I assume um, is not just a resume. <laughs> no, no, no. For Yeah, for... <laughs> For late night shows, you submit a packet. For scripted shows, you submit a writing sample. So like a script you've written. Um, and a packet is just your version of the, of the show. But okay. some shows have their own requirements, and, and a lot of them do. And so instead of answering my question about the requirements, he just sent my name on to the head writer of the show to submit. And... I had no idea he was doing that. And so uh, I got an email like a couple of days later from the head writer of the daily show asking me to submit for the show. And that was like, Oh, Holy shit. I wasn't prepared for this. And I was like 25, 26 at the time. And I'd always dreamed that like my daily show dream would come true when I was like 35 and had written for like seven or eight shows that I didn't really care for. And would get my like dream opportunity. And here I was like 10 years earlier <laughs> with this opportunity. So I, I submitted, I sub- did my submission and the first time, and I actually didn't get hired. I came in second place to someone who, uh, who already works there. And then, uh, but it was such a close second that they didn't want to, they didn't want to not hire me. Uh-huh. And so they ended up a couple weeks later, still offering me a job. Um, which I was completely surprised by because <laughs> they told me that I didn't get it, but they told me how close I came to getting it. And then they had me come to New York to meet with John, uh, which I had no idea why. And I was like, okay, well, if I, I guess I need to meet John Stewart. That's cool. Yep. And then he offered me the job. <laughs> and so it ended up still working out. That's awesome. I had that one time in my life where I got a, had a job interview. They called me back and said, yeah, we decided to go with someone else. You were, you were the second choice. And I'm like, okay. And? That's it. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks for nothing. <laughs> but yeah, it was, that, it was so. crazy. Like gave, being asked to come out there after I knew I came in second <laughs> and they were like, Oh yeah, you still come, come meet with John. I'm like, but why? Like, I didn't like <laughs> Don't the throw whole this. time. No one was telling me anything. And I'm like, they're introducing me to all these people in the office and showing me around I'm like, why are they doing this? This is the worst second prize ever. <laughs> just, just showing a person all the things they didn't get. Just, just throw it in my face. <laughs> yeah. And then after the uh, after the taping that night, that John offered me the job. That's that's incredible. That's that's awesome. And then yeah, clearly it, you've you've taken that opportunity and and had wonderful success everywhere. And congratulations on your your Emmys, your Oscars, your more. I I, I expect more. Oscars in your in your oh, future. I can I hope <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, but we'll we'll kind of jump into. I know your your time is uh, um, I will say precious. <laughs> uh, but kind of kind of one of the reasons you're here is that you've had some pretty incredible weekends recently, whereas you were able to go to the um, the U.S. Grand Prix as well as the Mexican Grand Prix. Um, have you always been into motorsport, or is that one of those things that you kind of come across later in life? Yeah, no, I I came across F1 around 2015. Um, I had always knew about it, but I never really dove into it because, like, it wasn't a very American thing, you know? Like, there was the Long Beach Grand Prix, which I remember when I was in college. Um, but there was no entry point for racing from either where I grew up or even just for – outside of NASCAR, which we, we know about because you see NASCAR all the time in the States. Um, and it wasn't until um, Trevor Noah, when he took over Daily Show, or actually when he started, you know, as a, um, a correspondent before he became host, you know, him and Lewis Hamilton are, are buddies. And, are, and um, he was telling me, you know, you got to like, watch F1 and I'm like I know like Schumacher Santa like I've heard of Lewis but I didn't know there was nowhere to even watch it really mm-hmm. here around that time. I don't even know where where do you watch F1 in the states in 2015 like I can't even remember where you could even watch it I, and I, you know, so that's about the time I really started to pay attention and that would yeah. have been I think the only time I like was able to just like turn it on TV would be like the Monaco Grand Prix you know right. like, Monaco yeah Monaco the big one to probably get on ESPN but like 
the rest of the season, it's like, where could you even watch it? And so that was another reason why it was just like not a thing people really knew about or, or knew how to get into. And so it wasn't until then I started actively looking for the sport and, and trying to get into it. And that was kind of my entry point to it. And then um, it's another thing to discover a sport. And then you realize oh, there's only one black person. <laughs> like there's only one person who looks like me in this entire sport and they treat him as such. <laughs> and yep. you're just like, okay, well, that's interesting. It makes it easy to decide who to root for, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. At least on my accord. <laughs> um, and so, um, and then it just, just turns out that he's also like fucking – Lewis Hamilton. He is like one of the greatest drivers of all time. And, um, you know, you watch that develop over the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, it's like, I don't feel, I don't feel bad for like coming into the sport and being a Lewis fan. It's like, yeah, when I, you know, what made me start watching golf, Tiger Woods, (laughs) you know, it's funny how when a person looks like you or is doing a thing, you actually become interested in it. (laughs) Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it was just like, but I'm like fans of so many other drivers. It's, it's, I love Lando. I love George Russell. I love Charles. I love Sebastian Vettel. Um, Max Verstappen. Yeah, like the, the, the <laughs> yeah, not so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> I figured, I figured. I'm, uh, I'm actually like you. Just, everyone you just listed off. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan as well. This year, not so much with Max. I just, I've kind of picked that side of like Lewis or Max. I'm like, eh, I'm going with Lewis. I for some reason, I just can't like. Netflix did great by making F1 accessible to everybody, and that's why it's so popular here now. Yeah, and I know a lot of people are fans of Red Bull because of the show because of the show i was a fan and then the show came out and i'm like i i'm less of a fan now <laughs> yeah it's you no know, it's fascinating because as a fan of the sport and you know i met max in mexico um and because a couple of guys i was there with are were drivers uh one guy drives nascar um another guy um um, was, is also was also a driver in a lower class, and they came up with Max. So they're like Max's buddies, like really, really close friends. I didn't know this when I got invited, because um, the 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 person who invited me through Alfa Romeo, um, Darren Jack, is a memorabilia salesman. He has a company called Hall of Fame um, uh, Hall of Fame Collection, and so I didn't know his friends were Max buddies. And so at some point, at one point we all were together with Max and, um, and they know that I'm a huge Lewis and Mercedes fan. So you're, so you're, you're were, probably with your Mercedes hat on, or I guess if you're, with oh, Alfa, you're with I, Alfa. I didn't, I wore it to Austin. I didn't wear it to Mexico cause I got invited by Alfa Romeo. So I left that makes the, sense. The at home, <laughs> um, just out of respect. Um, and, and so they were like, talking to me about Max throughout the weekend and their friendship and how, like, what kind of guy he was. And, you know, I was like, eh, I get it. I know he's your friend. I get it. Like it, it's, it's your friend. Of course you support your friend. Yep. And of course you see things differently when it's your friend. Um, so it's like, no, like no harm. You don't have to defend being friends with Max to me. Like it's a, I, it's not going to change anything. For me. <laughs> um, and so um, at one point, you know, they're like, we were like kind of standing around with him for a few minutes, just kind of chatting. And, um, you know, in, in isolation, he's a fine person. He's I'm, a, I'm, like, I'm sure. Like, I'm sure. He's, a, he's a nice guy. Um, but when you take Red Bull in totality, it becomes a different thing. And, and it's, it's hard to isolate, you know, the things Christian Horner says and does and the thing, the way that team functions um throughout the the season and you know i and i came into this wanting to be a fan of max in the same way i am of sebastian and all the other drivers on other teams who are not like my, my primary team of support but i like them as drivers and it just be it got so like nasty in a way where i'm just like even the biggest thing for me was 
when I saw how racist Red Bull fans were online. Oh, really? That to me was the biggest, that was the like, the stake in the ground where it was like, okay, well, I can't be a part of this. I can't support anything that involves this and then it's unchecked. And then not only is it unchecked, it's kind of festered by Christian and Helmet and that and the when that team, the way they the way they do things, even the way they treat Yuki Sonoda is kind of gross. And yeah. um I mean the way they immediately threw him under the bus and in and uh and qualifying uh, and qualifying was unbelievable and he didn't even do anything. <laughs> yeah, he went off track out of the way. Nope, his and, fault. It's like no, he Perez followed him off the track. <laughs> yeah, it made no sense. And like he over the radio, we got Sonoda, and it's like all of a sudden, what happens? He starts getting racist shit said to him online immediately. Yep. And it's like, come on, guys. Like, come on. And so that was when it became like, all right, well, this is if this is what it's going to be, this is what it's going to be. But um, I I love the sport itself and, and so supporting, you know, a lot of different drivers. But, I mean, obviously, Lewis is, is my – the horse that I'm riding on in this race. And, um, yeah. And I'm, and I hope it, I hope it works out for it. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited for the the remainder of the season. I, I, I can't remember being this excited about the end of a season in a while. Cause yeah. theoretically they could go into the last race tied, which and is that's incredible. insane. <laughs> Absolutely insane. Uh, was Austin your first in-person formula one experience or had you been, had you gone before? No, Austin was first, man. It was it was amazing. I got invited by by Team Lewis, and um, it was it was really cool, really fun. Um, getting to like hang out at the track and um, just be up close to the sport in a way that you know a lot of people don't get to have access to, and then you know getting to have spend time with Lewis at the end of the weekend and, and talk about the race and um, just in the season, it was like such a cool way to like experience formula one, you know, especially this season. Oh, absolutely. I always liking it to like hanging out with Michael Jordan during the like 96 bulls run. And you're like, Oh man, just like mid season, hanging out with Mike talking about the season. You're like, <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah. That's, that's one of those things you're going to look back on and just in, in awe of like, I I can't believe I was there. Like I'm I'm so I'm so jealous you even got to go like all the people that got to go to these races, but you're like you have the experience. <laughs> yeah, man. It's it's so surreal. Like even like I ran into Lewis in Mexico when we were chatting for, for a second and just the idea of like seeing like making eye contact with Lewis across like a walkway and him recognizing you and coming over and like talking to you is like crazy to me <laughs> like, it's like wow this is there's a there's a part of me that's in in such an awe of him and his ability and, and who he is as a person that you like you have to remind yourself that you're you're talking to a person because he's so just like he has this presence that um the way he carries himself and the way that he even the, the energy around him is just so different and um and you know everyone wants to be where he is. You see everyone following him. You see all the cameras, you see all the, all the fans, everyone, everywhere he goes in the paddock, everyone's following him. And so for him to break that, that chain and give you time, you know, directly, like it says something about him and about, you know, what he thinks about you, which is, is really cool. Oh, for sure. Had had you met him before Austin or was that the first time? No. So that we had been planning, like I had been in talks with his team and his people and been planning to try to like to, to meet up at some point. And so Austin, like on, was, like on a professional level, like for like filming and stuff. Yeah. Just like on a creative level, just on like, you know, they're looking to do creative endeavors and, um, you know, he, they're looking to expand his brand in the States. And, um, I felt like I could help. Like, I feel like I could, if you're going to do that, with someone maybe like someone who not only knows the the creative side of it well, but also understands the sport and understands you in a way that would make for the best opportunity to, to do something and do it well. So that was kind of the impetus for starting that relationship. And I had a bunch of meetings and, you know, it, it's not easy to get close 
to, to him. It's not easy. His team doesn't let you in the bubble very easily. So you have to earn your way in there and prove that you're not like just one of the millions of people who just want to be like, Oh my God, Lewis Hamilton. Like, it's just like, no, like there's a genuine, I genuinely want to help you tell your story whenever you're ready to tell it. And that's kind of what it is. No, that, that would be incredible. Um, and like, just, obviously I don't know you both personally, but like going through like your Instagrams and like following you both, it's just kind of like, you can tell that you two would like, would run in the same direction after the same goals with the same ideas. And it would, it just, it would just make sense. So yeah, I, yeah, definitely. Like we, that was part of it was like, Oh, like the more I learned about him, it was like, Oh, I see so much of myself in you. And we're, like, we're the same age, which is weird. Too. Like, even when I think about that, I'm like, Oh God, we're both 36, except <laughs> you've done so much more with your life. <laughs> like you've got seven world driving championships and um, it's like, yeah, I'm doing okay for myself. But Jesus, <laughs> You really maximize that 36 years. <laughs> yeah. Or even like I'm cheering for Lando. I'm like, he's 22. 22 man I, when i when i saw his birthday come up the other day i was like oh man look at lando he's like 25 now it's like 22 22 the kid oh, like that that, that class of drivers is incredible for the future of formula one. Oh man these next like 10 years of formula one are going to be unbelievable it, it's it's so good i'm i'm so excited for where where it's headed it's it's i mean I'm excited to find out like who's who's George Russell's teammate going to be when Lewis leaves. Like I'm thinking that far ahead, like that mm-hmm. level of excitement, like just a new duo in 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 like one of the top cars when Lewis finally hangs it up. It's like what's that going to be like? Who's going to who's going to be in that seat? Like Max will be one of the older guys at that point. Mm-hmm. Like he's all what is he 25, 26? <laughs> yeah, he's, right. he's young too, but yeah, it's I think he's, he's 20. He just turned 24, 25, right? I, um, yeah, but even sure. still compared to his, those guys, he's like, he's the older guy in the group. Yeah. He's, he's the and, veteran. He's been there. <laughs> yeah. And he's only like 24. And so like, it's, it's going to be, I mean, so what's, what's Sebastian 37? Yeah. He's up there when, 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 you, when you talk about racing ages and you know, these guys are 10 years younger than these guys, <laughs> 10 or 12 years younger which means they're going to be driving for so long and we haven't even seen them in the best cars or, or like it, like at the top of the, in the front of the grid yet. And they're, they're already this close. Like it's going to be exciting, man. I'm excited for it. Yep. No, I, I think the Netflix kind of picked the perfect time to just latch into formula one because the, yeah, that class that's coming in the, the caliber of drivers that they're attracting, it's, it's, it's a good time to be focused on formula one. Totally is. Uh, so, so how, like you went to Austin and you were you were there to like meet meet up with Lewis Hamilton and, and talk and talk about uh, future plans potentially and but so what was your thoughts or were you like how did it feel to like be part of like the the VIP stuff and like behind the scenes and like just just be at your first Formula One event be that involved? It was um it was it was really cool. Like I didn't realize. Um, I didn't even realize there was like another level to like the invitation that I would even gotten until I got there. It was like, Oh, like I have a pretty VIP experience. There's even another level to this, which is what I got in Mexico. Yeah, yeah. And so like, even as much fun as Austin was like, and I got a great time. Hey, like we were in a suite right on, on turn, uh, turn 15, turn 13. And like we had a great view of the track, great food. Like it was awesome. Um, and getting to be around, like, that was more of an invitation from team Lewis Hamilton, not Mercedes AMG. Mm-hmm. So like, that was the people who like run his PR and all of his like business and stuff like that. Those are, that's who like that invitation came through. And so, that's where it was, it was a bit more of a, it was a bit less track involved and more like people involved. Whereas the Alpha Romeo experience was very much track and garage and like team oriented and less driver oriented. 
even though like the drivers were a big part of that experience. Okay. Makes sense. So, but it was, it was great. It was hot as hell, <laughs> but it was, it was a fun first experience because just like being at a track, seeing it up close, um, having great seats and, and just being a part of like an, an incredible race. That race was so good. It was so close. I mean, if, if Mick doesn't give Max that fucking DRS, who knows oh, man. how that race ends. And, and um, it was exciting to, to kind of like watch that start and watch Lewis have that great start. And um, yeah, it was, it was great, man. It was Mex- uh, awesome. Was, was awesome. And then um, Mexico came around and like, there's just no experience like the paddock, man. It is just unparalleled. Like, to be able to just hang out around the drivers and talk to them and like do pretty like the garage experience, being able to ask any question you want to into all the right people and versus like wondering what things are like or wondering why this thing happened or wondering how this thing works. Like just going up, like I had such a great time talking to Ruth Buscom who does strategy for Alfa Romeo and like, she went over the strategy with me for the weekend and like all this showed me all this data and like, it was so cool. Like it was so awesome. Like being in the garage and talking to the guys about uh, car development and aero and like the differences between the cars and like how they're developing their car. Like you can't get that anywhere else. Like you just can't. And like even talking to Kimmy and Gio it was just like, it was, it was crazy, man. Yeah, you're you're in this situation where they're like no pictures. They'll, they'll they'll tell you, but no pictures. Like you're like so like getting yeah, to, and, to getting to talk yeah. to them about like strategy, engineering data. They, like that's like that's exactly what I would want. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, they definitely. I I definitely got some things that they were like, don't show, don't put this on the internet. <laughs> yeah, yep. they're like, don't you can have this, but don't show anyone. Uh, like awesome. that kind of thing, but. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the cool thing about the garage, too. They're like, you know, they let you take pictures in the garage, but the rule is if the chassis is open, no photo. Like, if, oh, if, OK. If, if the car is open, no photos. Um, but like when when they're leaving the garage or like putting their getting dressed, putting their helmets on, all the, all the cool shit, like they'll let you take a photo or like video of. But like and maybe not every team. I imagine other teams are stricter than others just because of how precious they are about protecting mm-hmm. even like remotely any secret but like even the Merc garage they showed me everything man really like everything See, i saw all the engines i talked to the engine guy he like went over all these like different elements of the engine with me um even though i even met the fuel guys like everybody the, the petronas guy uh team uh lewis's lewis and, and botas's car were both completely open and, and like being set up for for the race so, like, I saw all the inner workings of their cars, got to look at the, the floors of their cars and see the different, like, aero stuff that had gotten changed from 2020 to 2021. And it was a suit. Like, Angela gave us a super tour, man. She was great. That's that's That right there is the, the dream event for me. Like, that's if I go to an F1 race, that's I would want that more than anything else that has to do with the event. I could I could actually miss the race. I would I would want I would want that experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, even seeing Lou, like even just seeing Lewis's steering wheel was like, Oh, that's really cool. Like we couldn't touch it because of COVID, but oh, like, yeah. it was, like you could literally get close enough to it to like, like see how it works and like all that kind of shit. And like, you're looking at everyone <clears throat> on their screens, running different data for the weekend. And they're explaining to you what these lines mean, what the, what's going on here. What are they doing? What are they working on? Um, it's, it was like being a kid in a candy store, man. It's if you care, if you love the technical side of F1 in any capacity, and you want to hear about it from the people who are doing it every day. Like there's nothing like that experience. Yeah. That's absolutely incredible. And then we're, did they tell you to bring your Oscar with you or did that just happen to like work out that way? So, so here's, here's how that happened. <laughs> um, I was the Sunday before the Mexican Grand Prix. Um, I was at a friend's house for like a brunch and Joey badass calls me and he's like, Hey, 
I'm about to film my music video tomorrow and I want to use the Oscar in it. Can I fly you to New York with it tonight or like red eye, like Monday morning? Um, and I said, well, I'm actually going to be in New York on Tuesday. So I'm already coming to New York this week. And so he's like, great. Can, can I, can you give it to this person for me so they can fly it here tonight so that I can use it tomorrow and give it back to you on Tuesday? Um, so I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. So I gave it to him. And the thing was, my plans were New York, Mexico home. So I never planned to go back home. So the Oscar had to come with me to Mexico because it, there was no other way for it to get like get back home it was like it had to go with me. And so um, after it wasn't until like after I was like, oh, fuck, I'm not coming back home. I'm going to have to take this Oscar to Mexico with me. And so I was a little nervous about it because I just didn't want anything to happen to it. And so I get there, I get to the hotel and I just, it's in a bag and I put it away in the room and I forget about it for the whole weekend. <laughs> and Saturday afternoon, we're sitting in the paddock, we're sitting around, me and a bunch of the alpha guys and we're talking and then someone brings up the movie, brings up my movie and starts, we start talking about the Oscars and then I go, oh yeah, the Oscars in my hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, what, are you serious? I was like, yeah, I was like, it's a long story, but it ended up having to come to Mexico with me because I loaned it to someone and blah, blah, blah. And um, they were like, you have to bring it tomorrow. And so, and then it was race day. And so because of like, obviously they were like super hospitable to me. I was like, yeah, like I'll bring it tomorrow. And like, like they like geeked out over it. It was amazing. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, then, Emmy loved it. It was it was hilarious. And then you end up uh, getting interviewed on the Gridwalk. Yeah, you- <laughs> with Martin. That was that was awesome. I mean, if it was that- if it got me a grid interview with Martin Brundle, I'll fuck. I'll take it. Yeah was was that planned at all, or was it? Did he just like, oh hey, he's <sighs> he's got an Oscar. <laughs> so he, so I met Crofty on Saturday, and we were talking and my friend Darren was with us, who was also on the grid with me. And, um, uh, he told Crofty we were going to be on the grid tomorrow or we might be on the grid tomorrow, but that was like the extent of it. And, and so when, uh, I don't even think he knew at that point that I was going to have it with me. And so when we were on the grid, I think word got around because it had been at the paddock for so long, especially when like me and Kimmy and Antonio were sitting outside uh, with it. And a lot of cameras had come around and Damon Hill had even come over to like, take a look. It, it had become a thing that like, I think word had gotten around. There's an Oscar in the paddock and um, we're standing on the grid and I see Martin, talking to Mazepin and then I see he's like walking in my direction, but I don't know if he's coming to me or not. (laughs) And then all of a sudden he's standing in front of me (laughs) and uh, I'm like, Oh shoot, we're doing this. And so I don't know what people are seeing at home. I don't know what people are hearing at home. And like, it, at, like right after my phone blew up oh, and course. everyone sent me videos or screenshots and they had like my name and everything on there. So like they did their research, like oh, the yeah. fact that he even mentioned that I had any connection to Lewis was like blew, blew my mind. <laughs> Cause I'm like, how do you know? No one knows. How do you know that? Like I even know them. And it, so it was, it was, it was crazy and amazing all at the same time. Yeah, but it was funny because he's asking like point blank. He's like, you're here with Lewis. What are you working on? It's like, like, he's not going to tell you on national television. Yeah. But like <laughs> the answer was like nothing. <laughs> like, it's like, we weren't working on anything. I literally <laughs> just met the guy a week ago <laughs> or was it two weeks? Between yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, like, I'm like who I, in the moment I wanted to be like, who told you that? But at the same time, <laughs> I wanted to make sure it was clear that like Mercedes or like Lewis's team didn't think I was just going around telling people I was working. Like, I don't know how you know this Martin Brundle, but 
we aren't doing anything yet. I'm in the, I'm just trying to work with Lewis on anything. <laughs> yep. Well, that was fun. And then of course it's the week after the whole, um, Megan the Stallion incident. So it's just like, right, right. <laughs> like you just did that. It, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. It became a, I got a, I got so many tweets about like, that's how you're supposed to like act on the grid when you're a celebrity and all this kind of <laughs> stuff. And, you know, I felt, I felt bad for Megan because yep. she tried and the situation just didn't play out in the way that, you know, would be ideal, but also, I don't know how big of a fan of F1 Megan the Stallion is. Yeah. I would guess not much. Probably um, not. just 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 a hunch. I don't think she cares very much about Formula One. Um, I think I might have even heard she has a Red Bull deal or something, which might have been the reason why she oh, was there. Oh, that would make sense. Um, I'm not. I can't confirm that, but I think I heard yeah. that might have been the reason. Um, and so I think the. I think where Martin went wrong was asking her to rap. <laughs> um, it was so that, awkward. Yeah, that that was a mistake. I think I think if he had just talked to her about, you know, why she was there and that kind of thing, it might have gone a little better. Yeah. Um, but it like it kind of is like the equivalent of like if you ran into LeBron on the grid and you're like, LeBron, d- d- dribble this ball like. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be that great of a thing to ask. No. Um, and, and- so it, it was. It was weird on both on both accounts. Yeah, and and no one likes to be put on the spot. Yeah, you know, it just it just it just makes it awkward. So, yeah, but yeah, I'm I'm it was it was cool to see you, you know, on national tele international television. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it was it was great to like you know for a weekend for a day to be like an F one fan and for people to know like to know it and to like be to have the F one experience. I mean, even like that great experience was so amazing. And then you add on top of that, like George Russell giving me his hat when I was leaving the grid, which was cool. It was just like an, it was just an incredible, incredible weekend. So you're just, so you go to these things and then George just tosses you his hat. So I assume you're starting to collect a, a little bit of a pretty incredible F1 memorabilia collection. Yeah. I ran into him in the bathroom. <laughs> funny enough, actually, the fr- on Friday, I ran into him and we were talking um, for a little bit with Darren, with my friend Darren. And and I was like, in our conversation, I was like, man, I've been trying to find your hat for over a year now and you can't buy anywhere. And if you look online, you cannot find the Williams Racing GR63 hat anywhere. Huh. I've looked everywhere you can imagine on the internet, eBay the Williams racing website, formula one website. There is no place to find the GR 63 hat. You couldn't find it at the beginning of the season. You definitely couldn't find it when he got announced as a Mercedes driver. So I had been like calling in every favor I could of anyone I knew who had any connection to F1 and be like, Hey, if you can find a GR 63, like, please like get it for me. I'll pay for it, whatever I have to do. Just like, please, like, if you can find one, I know it's going to be impossible after he leaves for Williams. Um, so he's like, Hey man, go to the paddock and, um, and they'll sort you out with one. We like, we have, we have some in there and I go over a little later and they're like, Oh, we're all out. Um, we gave them like, I think we gave them all out. And, which I was kind of like, did you? Um, Cause they're pretty scarce. And they were, even they were like, they're pretty scarce. Um, but I'm like, I know you have enough for George. There's gotta be enough so that he has one every weekend and has another one if he needs it. You know what I mean? Yep, yep. And so, um, so then on race day, I'm in the bathroom. I look over one stall over, George Russell's using the stall <laughs> next to me, uh, using the urinal next to me. And then we're at the sink together washing our hands. And I'm like, I was like, yeah, man, I tried to go to the paddock for that hat. And uh, they said they were all out. So I guess like no luck this weekend, man. He was like, oh, dude, he's like, it's all, he's like, I'll, he's like, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll sort it out for you. And, and in my head, I'm like, you're about to race in like, in like <laughs> half an hour. I can't imagine. You have other things to do. <laughs> yeah, like finding a hat for me is a top priority of yours. And so um, 
I just assumed, you know, you know what? Chalk it up as a loss. It's not meant for me to have the GR63 in my collection. Fine, whatever. I'll live. I'll get a GR. I'll get a GR63 Merc hat next year when they drop. Um, and so I'm filming myself leaving the grid as we have to leave the grid before the race starts. And walking toward me is George Russell. And, I, and you see it's on video. It's on it's on Twitter. <laughs> he sees me, takes the hat off his head, tosses it to me, and, ke- and just keeps walking to the grid. <laughs> That's and, so cool. And, and my and my friends who are with me knew I had been trying to get that hat. And so everyone went crazy. <laughs> it was like, oh, <laughs> he finally got it. Like, and you got it off his head. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I was oh. I was so happy I was recording in that moment because it was just like it was such a great great moment yeah you couldn't have asked for a better setup right like just a perfect ending to this <laughs> and it was like there was no way to know he was leaving or he was coming up we just so happened to be leaving at the same time at, at the right time and it just timed out perfectly that i was walking past him as he was coming onto the grid and he's like here you go <laughs> that's so awesome um do you have other memorabilia that you're acquiring do like do you have like a crown jewel of if like is that you i know you, have, you collect shoes and i yeah. you, you, you seem to kind of be more... i have i have a helmet collection i have two lewis helmets Jeez. i have uh i have the antonio and the kimmy helmet from mexico um i have a views uh, they're all signed or or <sighs> or um used um except for my Lewis Aria helmet from 2015 is a, it's, it's one of his helmets, but he didn't, he didn't use it. Okay. So it was, it's an, it's a real, it's not a replica. It's a real Lewis Hamilton Aria helmet, but not he didn't race. race it. Not, okay. Gotcha. And so, um, and I have, uh, I have a, I have the Charlotte Claire Monaco helmet signed one of three. Oh, wow. Um, I have what I think is probably going to be the crown jewel of the collection coming next week which is my signed uh, Senna helmet that I, I found. (laughs) Oh my God. uh, Last, last week. Um, And I can't wait for that thing to show up. Um, That's incredible. And I have, uh, I have, Oh God, I have so much stuff. I have a race use Valtteri suit. I have race use Charles and Carlos signs, Nomexes. I have race use Valtteri boots. I have two sets of race shoes, Hamilton gloves. Um, I have a set of Valtteri's gloves, race shoes gloves. I have Lewis's 2018 Silverstone gloves when he Jeez. drove from like 18th to, or 20th to second. Uh-huh. Um, I have one of Senna's front wing elements, <laughs> one of his front wing pieces. Um, I think that's like. That's like the bulk of the collection. I think that might that's, that's, that's that a, sounds like that's pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> I might be missing a thing or two, but that's that's uh that's most of it. Wow. Yeah, I'd say you're well on your way to the the crown jewel of what what would be anyone's crown jewel. It's like, oh yeah, I got these four. And it's like I would any of those would be incredible. It's it's so yeah. that's so cool, man. I gotta get Lewis to sign the uh the twenty fifteen helmet um one of these days and then I got to get a Schumacher helmet. Then I can put my Santa and Lewis and Mick or Michael helmets like together. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be, a, that'd be an incredible display. <laughs> that, that's, that's awesome, man. Um, do you have any inclination or like desire to get on the track yourself? No, you know, not really only because like, as much as I love racing and as much as I love driving, you know, if as I, I used to have a Maserati and I love driving that thing. <laughs> um, I, I don't, I don't fit in race cars. Like I'm six foot seven. Like it's not built for me. They do, aren't built for me. Do they make so, shoes, I, race shoes in your size? I don't even know if you <laughs> get race shoes in a size 16, man. Man. Um, but I know there's some two seater stuff that people have mentioned. Um, you, yeah. You can probably do sports car stuff exciting um yeah you know i'm i'm i would i would love to have a track experience but um awesome. i would love to just sit in a formula one car like i just want to sit in one like if i could just sit in the <laughs> w11 or 
or like the 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 MP4, uh, like that. Those would, that would be amazing. Even though I couldn't fit, I just want to try to just yeah, just with, squeeze in there, just, get the picture. Like, right, yeah, like <laughs> you just take the seat out. Just take the seat out and let me sit in it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm 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 right there with you. That'd be that'd be cool. But yeah, but if you do want to get on track for a track day experience, I think we know a few guys. <laughs> just yeah, just, I mean, just come out to the Midwest. I, yeah, I'd love to try to figure something out. Um, I I know we're running out of time that you have. There are f- few things I, I, that's a little more serious. I was hoping we could talk about. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Um. Have you read, or I guess I assume you have? What What are your thoughts on the Hamilton report? You know, I I wasn't surprised. You know, mm-hmm. like it's one of those things that when you you come into a, an environment that is historically white, right? Mm-hmm. Historically, it does not look like you. It does not necessarily cater to people who come from where you come from or look like you it is it is not built for people like you to thrive in that environment right it's it's set up in a way where the people with money have the advantage have the best ability and chances to do the thing and we know globally statistically like black and brown people aren't the wealthiest people on earth and we don't have um you know a lot of those opportunities in the same way and so it wasn't surprising that, you know, the findings were what they were because it's what it's been, right? It never had a reason to be different. Like even if Hamilton had never come along, there was no one in the sport who was going to challenge it for being white or Mm -hmm. challenge it for being too male. It, those things happen when we allow people into a space that haven't traditionally been invited. Right. So like you don't get, uh, like Ruth Buscombe being the only female strategist on the on the pit wall until someone allows her the opportunity to be in a position to work her way up to that position, right? And now other girls see that it's possible. Now other girls decide to become engineering majors so that they can become Formula One strategists. And the same with, with Lewis, like a Black kid whose dad or parents might have more money than Lewis's parents, his ha- parents had might have the ability to, you know, give their kid a carding experience and create more opportunities for, uh, for black and Brown kids to become uh, racing drivers or even working in the, in the garages. Like I, when I was in the Mercedes garage, there were more black people, than I'd seen in the entire paddock (laughs) for the weekend. And I know it's a product of Lewis. Like I know it's a product of him being like, this can't be this way if I'm here. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And my, my hope is that when he leaves the sport, that those things don't lead with him. Right. That, that we, we race as one is a thing that exists while Lewis is here. But when he leaves, we don't really talk about it. And it's like, you know, there are, there are Checos, Mexican, there are people of other ethnicities um, on the grid as well. And um, you hope that it becomes a thing that people talk about more and you get away from situations where people like Christian Horner and the people who are saying they don't see color and this and this and that, like realize how how wrong it is to, to, to believe that because, you know, people, people often don't understand why I don't see colors or is a, a bad thing to say. Not, not necessarily, I won't say bad. It's an, an errant thing to say because right. by virtue of saying you don't see color, you're ignoring the fact that this person's having a different experience than you. I think like you can't afford to, to not see this person's color or gender because the, all things aren't created equal. Exactly. I think that was my, the biggest take like eye opening experience for me in the last handful of years was that you know growing up i i grew up in a very small town northwest iowa 90 oh, let's see 96% white um so my experiences were dramatically different than yours growing up in compton mm-hmm. um so like when you say that 
yeah, years ago I would have said that, oh, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not racist. I don't see color. Not realizing like the, the, the damage that, act, that phrase actually says, like, right. Like we don't want to just push everything aside. We, like we got to admit that there, yeah, we're, we have different experiences. We're from different places. It's before all, it's all about time, respect. Before a period of time, I don't see color was the acceptable thing to say. Right. It was the, it was the next step away from like being racist or not, or being thought of as accepting racism or being, or participating in any way, which is like, I don't see color. And then enough people had to point out why I don't see color is not the right thing. And then we graduate to the next thing. So now people know I don't see color is not the answer. It's you need to see color Mm -hmm. because you need to understand the differences we're having. And so it doesn't mean everyone who was saying for 10 years or 15 years in the nineties and early thousands, when that was acceptable, an acceptable thing to say to make yourself seem like you understood other people that you were bad for saying it or thinking it It was like, no, that was the understanding at the time. Now we know better. Now we know differently. Now we understand how, while that was progress, then we have to progress now. And that I don't see color. Even we, we races one is a little bit towing that same line where it's like, yeah, we races one, but you know, you gotta, you gotta understand that like Yuki Sonoda and Lewis Hamilton are having very different experiences. And so, um, excuse me. And so, will um, uh, Guangzhou, uh, the, the Alfa Romeo driver is going to experience the same thing. I have no doubt. It's already started. Oh, yeah. It already, he already, it already started online. And so there's a, a, a formula one, can be more vocal about what we races one actually means or what it's supposed to stand for. And they, they don't. And, and I think, you know, they're doing the bare minimum. I think they can do better. I think people like Christian Horner can be more aware of the, the effects their words have on the drivers who they are saying them about Mm -hmm. Um, and pretending like you don't know, when you when you constantly question Hamilton's intellect, that that has a sub a subliminal meaning to it, or when Yuki Tsunoda constantly gets treated um, like a, a second class driver or like something's his fault that isn't that that has other, another connotation to it. It's 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 just, it's a thing that you can only be aware of if more people who aren't like you are around to point it out, right? And if you're surrounded by people who come from your same background and don't know and don't get it, how will you ever know? Yep. That's, that was, that's one of the big things for me was I need to be comfortable having the uncomfortable conversations. And, and, and like, if if I'm doing something totally back of the mind, not realizing it, I want to be made aware of it. Like, so like, and a, a big part of that too is, we have to stop being afraid to make mistakes. We all do it. Whether you're black, white, whatever you are, we all make mistakes, whether it's around gender, sexuality, sexual orientation, or race. We all do it. What we have to stop doing is making it seem like if you make the mistake, it's irredeemable. You you can make the mistake and you can be corrected and then you move on. Mm-hmm. So like, if you have an opinion or a thought that someone goes, oh, that's racist. It doesn't mean you're racist. It's that thought might be a racist thought. Now you need to investigate. Oh, where did I pick that up? Where did I learn that? How did I learn that? What's the correct the correct way to move forward from that thought? I am not a bad person. I am not a racist. But at some point in my life, it's somewhere along my journey, I picked up this thought or this belief that is is wrong or it is bad or it hurts people and I need to correct it. And then we move on together. And we and and don't get me wrong, there are racists in the world. There are people who are proud to hate other people of other colors and are proud to hate women and Jewish people and all those things. But there are the overwhelming majority of us are just learning. We're Mm -hmm. just learning and we're just trying to get it right. And we fuck up sometimes and you should be allowed to fuck up and be corrected and just move on. Oh, yeah, I yeah, there was a, at work. There's a big push for uh, diversity and inclusion, and there was um, one person in particular that is transitioning, and they changed from their uh, acronym from being he to she, 
mm-hmm. and then or and then I think they they also wanted they was an acceptable term. And then I remember one person was typically, like, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to call them. Well, I just, just, told just, you. just just ask. And then if you say but, it wrong, but I, and then, I just told you. Yeah, <laughs> then, I just told you it's it's they or them or it's he or she. Like, yeah, I you don't have to guess. I literally just told you yep. what it is, is. Is there's a resistance to there's a an, an unbelievable like kind of natural resistance to n- not being able to change how you address someone when we do it all the time constantly. Like I forget someone pointed out, it's like, you mean to tell me you can call Curtis Jackson 50 cent, but you can't refer to, you can't understand my pronoun change. <laughs> you can like all these other places where you where you do this, but you can't, you can't do it for me. A person who's like a real life person that you encounter. Yep. Yeah. It, it was, it was just so like, again, it was one of those moments where I was just like, really? Even if you get it wrong, they'll correct you. I think, it's it's just it's yeah. a simple mistake. As long as you're respectful, it's it's yeah. not that hard. <laughs> it's all I, there about- were people there were people who didn't know Checo and Sergio Perez were the same person when I was uh, <laughs> when I was uh, uh, I, I want to I forget if I was in Mexico or Austin, but there were just newer fans who who were at the race, and someone asked me, they're like, "Check who's Check uh, uh, che- or Checo Sergio?" I was like, "Oh no, Checo is his nickname. Yep. Sergio Perez is Checo." And it's like, how you can, you're calling him two different things. You have the ability to do it. You can call him Checo or Sergio Perez. You can call me, you used to call me he, now I'm asking you to call me she. That's a very simple adjustment. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But my, what I really liked about the Hamilton report was like in the conclusions, they really focused on basically presenting things to people that wouldn't normally see them. So like, you know, I grew up knowing like college was always an opportunity for me. I didn't want it at first and then realized later in life that that's, that is what I wanted. But I had those things put in front of me and I could decide. Right. So it, so it's so like one of the conclusions was like, well, putting, you know, Formula One as like a career path for like from an engineering standpoint, focusing on STEM stuff, like it was just putting that in schools early, especially in schools that are predominantly black or or minority. It was it was it was like, yeah. That's such a no brainer. Right. Just, just, these are just give the them basics. a path. <laughs> basics. Yeah. It's the basics. And you're like, Oh, now I got to give them an opportunity like <laughs> to teach them the same things. Like I don't understand the, the people who, who just, who have such an aversion to it. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Which Granted, I had the worst uh, guidance counselor in the history of guidance counselors because I wasn't on the basketball team, and that's all he cared about. Um, so, like, I I was never told I could go to college except from like by my parents, and like that was always the plan. But I'm I'm still assuming that was dramatically different than say even your upbringing in Compton was like yeah. going through whatever school system you were going through. Was that was there like a like a like a path saying like yeah, college is for everybody, like or was it? Was it different? It was, it was one of those things where college was a thing that clearly wasn't for everyone in that environment, but the guidance counselors were aware of like who could do it, you know, okay, like which kids had it in them. And a big part of sports when you're playing and when you live in like an inner city or you live in a place like, like Compton or even Long Beach is to get a scholarship because your family can't afford to pay for college. Like the scholarship is everything Mm -hmm. in the, in that environment because there's no, there's no legacy students. There's no, like my dad went to Harvard and his dad went to Harvard and his dad went to Harvard. So I'm going to get into Harvard and and, and we have the money to pay for it. It's like you f- you would have kids who run into being able to get into a school off their academic abilities, but couldn't pay for it. Mm. And so it's like you have the ability to get in, but it's like, well, now what are you going to do? And so you had to fight for these academic scholarships that were being given to to white kids 
from the for, rich neighborhood <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that didn't for, really need for, it. With, with like lower grades, oh. with but who had connections to the schools in a way that you might not have or because they weren't you. They didn't look like you. They didn't come from where you come from. And it's like the weird part is these things exist. These things are truths. These things are facts that are very much quantifiable. People don't like when you say them out loud. And if it makes you uncomfortable when they're said out loud, why not do something about it? Why not change it so that it is no longer a fact, so that it is a thing that I can say to you and you feel entirely comfortable knowing everything is fair and right. And it's so it's this weird ability or this weird thinking that if you give these kids from this city that I would never go into an equal opportunity to me or an equal playing field, I'm going to lose out. And it's like, well, no, you're not. Statistically, there's more people who look like you who might beat you for that position than me because you're going up against 1,500 other white people (laughs) and 100 black kids, right? Mm -hmm. And so when that, when like some of those black kids get that spot and they're like, they took my spot. It's like, no, they didn't. You weren't good enough because don't ignore the 1,400 white people who look like you who also got in. You didn't get in, not because of the the 100 black kids, to look the other way. Mm -hmm. They're also better than you. (laughs) And it's more (laughs) of them. So what does it say about you? Yeah. No, I think it's it's, it's people not wanting to look in the mirror and then just forcing the their own faults onto somebody else it, it's you know they they yeah it's if, if anytime i hear that it's like they took our job no they no they didn't because if, if you were good at that job they wouldn't have took it from you in the first place <laughs> exactly <laughs> how can someone take something from you that is yours if it's yours if you were good enough to do that job no one can take it from you Ab- absolutely like, or you don't want to do it like it's a job you don't want. They're doing jobs you don't want. I know you're. I know you're kind of. We're running over, and so I'll, I'll wrap this up. And uh, but this is this has been amazing. This is uh, this has gone as, as smooth as any interview I've ever I've ever done. This <laughs> I'm so happy. Um, uh, one thing I did want to ask in your original stand up when you were in college, you 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 were talking about these issues even way back then. Obviously, because it's, it's that's what you were living. Right. Was comedy kind of an an outlet to to like bring it to people's attention, work through, you know, frustrations and struggles or I guess, yeah, I guess what was it? Was it just kind of like putting it out there? Yeah, I think it it was like a combination of, I had been a fan of stand up like all through childhood. Like I watched Chris Rock specials on HBO, Carlin and all these guys. And the people who stuck out to me were the ones who were the truth tellers who were making people laugh while they were doing it. Um, I forget who, who says the quote, if you, if you're going to tell people the truth, you better make them laugh or something like that. Yeah. I can't remember Um, who, but I know the quote. Yeah. And, and so what I discovered in getting into wanting to talk about the things that I cared about and the things, the things of the issues of the world and just wanting to find ways to make it a better place. It was, Oh, comedy is a great vehicle for that. And, and it, it disarms people in a way that just trying to have a conversation or a debate doesn't. And I watched how brilliantly it was done by Chris and, 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 uh, people like Richard Pryor and and Carlin and Lewis Black and Jon Stewart and all these people who were doing these, these jokes and telling these stories about things that mattered, but in such a disarming and charming way. And I was like, I want to do that. Like, I want to be able to talk about the shit I want to talk about, while also entertaining people with it. And, and I think that was kind of what, what pushed me into that style of stand up and, and just even comedy writing, because I just I can't write about or talk about 
trivial things for very long. Like I can't, like I can't get up and do a half hour of jokes and never once talk about anything where you leave the theater or you leave the venue thinking about what I talked about or thinking about some, some larger issue and not cause I just talked about like cats and dogs for half an hour, you know, like it, I feel like I have this like feeling inside of me that I need to be doing things that affect the world I live in. I don't know how to be a bystander. I literally don't know how to do it. I, uh, I, some days I wish I could because it's exhausting, but, but I, I don't know how to sit by and watch things just be bad or just be unfair and equitable. And I can't pinpoint where in my life that fire was set or how it started. Um, but it's a thing that I don't, and I, and I know people who say like, Oh, I'm not political. I don't get into this. I don't get into that. And I don't know how, how you can, how it's even possible. Like what is it's happening e- it's easier in your brain way. all day? Yeah. Because I know what's happening in my brain all day and what's happening around me. And I don't know how to look at, the world that we live in today and not feel like, Oh, we need, a, there's a lot of work to be done. I don't know how to like live in a world where I, I spend however many years on this planet and I disappear and I either left made no effect on anything or didn't try to at least. No, I just don't know how to do that. I, yeah, ab- absolutely. Like I, I can't look at the world or the news and just go, this is acceptable. This is okay. No, yeah. absolutely not. Like when Booney presented the opportunity to interview you for the show, I was like, "Yes, I want to talk about Formula One and and and, and that type of stuff." But like, th- this is a great opportunity for me and to to put your voice to all of our listeners and 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 kind of go away from what is normally what our podcast oh. is. And I, I'm I'm so happy we we're able to do this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got to be on. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I've always liked comedy as a way to like break down those barriers because, like, again, growing up in a small town, white Northwest Iowa, seeing like Dave Chappelle um, put those skits in front of me, it's it's like I would not have otherwise been aware of any of those situations because you know it's not like they teach that in in right, in the farm right. farming community. Hey, well, well you know, right. but like even even like a like a Daniel Tosh is is talking about like. You know, the Winter Olympics is really just which country has the most rich white kids, and then like you know, right. even he's kind of bringing like bring it right. to people's attention. It's like you know, he's right. It is <laughs> the Olympics. Yeah, I love Daniel. <laughs> but yeah. I, I just thought it was so funny. He's like, yeah, I wonder. I wonder why snowboarding is not more popular in the inner cities. It only costs like nine hundred dollars a day. <laughs> Weird, right? <laughs> It's so true. You know, people don't think about those things. Well, I mean, it's it's just like same thing with like just in racing in general. Like you know, I, I'm I'm fully aware that I'm f- more fortunate than most that I get to do club racing and I'm and I, I can afford to do that. Right. Most people don't get that opportunity, or even get to be told like that. That's a path you could go down with your hobbies. Right. So yeah, it, it, doing a track day is not cheap. Of course, that's not going to be super popular. <laughs> in, in, a, in a in a setting where there's not a lot of extra money exactly um but yeah Tr- trayvon i really appreciate your time i i'm so happy that you came on and and talked about everything that we've talked about um yeah man thank good, you good good luck with all the like all these super uh, new projects that i don't get to know about until later <laughs> <laughs> uh where can where can people find you uh, I'm very easy to find i'm at trayvon t r a v o n on instagram and twitter that's if you see anything else anywhere else, it wasn't me. Perfect. <laughs> That's the two places I live. Occasionally, I'll try to TikTok, but I've kind of given up on it. But those are the two places you can find me. All right. Well, perfect. Again, thank you so much for your time. I'll let you get on with your day. Um, awesome. We'll, we'll, catch our, yep, we'll catch everybody else next week. Take care, Rob. This show wouldn't be possible without all of our sponsors, so I want to take a quick moment to thank everyone that uh, helps put the show on. I want to uh, thank... Apex Pro, you can hit them up at apextrackcoach.com. Use the code 10 tenths. Um, you get a 10% off of your order of a Gen 2 when you buy a Gen 2 unit and a window mount. It is the cheapest way to get on track and get into 
uh, data logging, and you can learn a lot about your driving. If you want to improve as a driver, Andrew at Apex Pro is is the man. So if you want to hit him up, apextrackcoach.com. Use code 10 tenths. Um, also, I want to thank Tech Boss Motorsports. That's uh, Their website is tekbosscompany.com. That's for all of your uh, electric scooters and pick, pick cart needs, um, four-wheelers, ATVs, all sorts of fun stuff. It's um, I can't go to a track anymore without my... Uh, my tech boss uh, scooter that I've got, it's, it makes life so much easier. Um, when I need to quick, a quick run across the paddock, instead of taking the time to walk or run, I was able to just hop on my scooter. Um, they're the best prices anywhere available. Again, if you use the code, uh, 10 tenths, you get, uh, you get 10% off your first order or actually any order, um, 10% off your order, hit them, hit them up, uh, T E K B O S S company.com factory fabrication, uh, factory fabrication.com for all of your, fa- uh, fabrication and, and custom furniture, all, all those, anything that you need, um, I also want to thank Petrobox. That's mypetrobox.com. Use the code TTP15 for 15% off of your first um, subscription box. That's a car care product, shirts, all sorts of just cool automotive goodies, tools. They also have a store, and it's going to be Black Friday here next week. They're, they're, they'll have even bigger sales. So anything that's available in the store, same thing. Use the code TTP15, 15% off um, anything that's available in their store. Um, and also, if you are a subscriber to their um, subscription box, you are automatically entered into a get a set of free rotiform wheels. They give those out every month. Um, it's the best odds that you could ever get for getting a free set of wheels, and um, they do it every month. So mypetrobox.com, use code TTP15. And also our friends over at Eyes Up Auto Art. He is taking commissions for um, like Christmas presents, stuff like that. So if you want to get some really cool hand-done art to your request, really, um, hit up Zach at Eyes Up Auto Art. Uh, send, tell him that we sent him. There's no code. We're just, we're just supporting a friend, and we think that uh, his art's really cool. If you've been watching the show at all, you notice that uh, the Dotson on the wall is his painting. He sent me a a blank painting with like an outline and a a uh, like a like a oh gosh like a like a paint set. I guess it was for lack of a better term, he sent me one of those just for fun, and I cannot wait to actually just do the painting and compare my remedial painting to his excellent painting but if you want your own like if you have a cool shot of like you on track or your dog or your family or maybe i don't know if he does people um your dog hit him up eyes up auto art 